So, well, first, let me say that it is a pleasure and an honor, Sarah, to be here again for your... Uh, we had a conference two or three years ago, I think, right? So I'm just delighted. Uh, what I want to talk about is really work in progress. There is no, that is why I wanted the slides, because the slides sort of summarize a lot of stuff. Like one of my maps has 10,000 dots, which are the surveillance stations in the United States. So just in one second, you get an impression you know, of a geographic space of surveillance. Um, so there is no conclusion to my argument. The basic hypothesis that I'm exploring has to do with the notion that beneath the virulence vis-a-vis -vis immigrants, beneath the invidious differencing of the citizen and the immigrant, that beneath the incredibly strong anti-immigrant sentiment, the, the renationalizing of the politics of membership, there is actually a structural approximation between immigrants and citizens, two subjects that are rather ambiguous, by the way. And this structural approximation happens both at the top, a whole new class of very rich and enabled people for whom citizenship is increasingly secondary, which is one way of instantiating <coughs> the devaluing of citizenship. And it happens at the bottom where more and more, say, the proper middle classes, the good old burghers, are getting poorer. And there also, this, what happens there, instant, ah, look at that, instantiates as a devaluing of citizenship. Now, I want to, I want to, so here is sort of very quickly, but I, I also want to argue sort of more conceptually, more analytically, a few points. Um, I need, sort of before arriving at questions of method, I need something that I call analytic tactics. Method is a discipline. You have method in the law as well. It allows you certain things, it disallows others. I argue that this is a time of unstable meanings. Meanings are never, I mean meanings like <coughs> of citizenship, of you know, of power, <coughs> government, markets, etc. Meaning, these complex meanings are never permanently stable. But they acquire a certain stability. I would argue that the Keynesian decades gave a certain stability to the meaning of the middle class, of the economy, of the state, etc., etc. And I think in the last 30 years, all those meanings have become increasingly unstable. And so that is a very large framing, if you want for what I'm arguing here. Now this I already just mentioned, these emergent spaces. So a, a second point for me is I'm interested in making. Now I'm sitting in front of a historian here, I don't know if other historians, history, historians are always take it all very seriously, but I am really interested, when I say the making of histories, it's not history huh, with capital. And um, so for instance, I would argue that inequality is made justice is made, power is made. Clearly that is a very particular kind, this is an analytic tactic also, a very particular kind of take on matters. But in that sense I want to argue that the immigrant subject is made, the citizen subject is made, and they can be unmade, both. Um, now some of the analytic tactics is the first one, the active destabilizing of stabilized meanings. And you'll see that I do that in this process. The second one is in the shadows of powerful explanations. In other words, confronted with a very powerful explanation, the master category, etc. I don't reject it. You cannot reject a powerful explanation. They are collective productions. They have outlived all kinds of critiques. They are there. They are to be taken into account. But my first move is to ask, what does it hide precisely because it is so powerful? So in that sense, in the shadow of powerful. So citizenship, very powerful concept. Immigrant, very powerful concept. I'm not so interested in what is the self-evident meaning of each. I'm interested in what, when I use those two terms, what am I not seeing? The final point, I don't think that I'm going to get to that. This is part of a new project of mine, etc. Now, for instance, instead of immigrant subject, spaces. These are all made with laws, with etc. 
And I, for instance, I arrived, I love to tell this story. I arrived at the United States as an illegal immigrant at a time that was far more benign. And for me, it was definitely an adventure. My first job was as a cleaning woman, cleaning also toilets. That adventure lasted for very short. After six months, I was so sick of it, I checked out. The other women in that space were women from the Caribbean, women from Latin America. They all did not think themselves simply a cleaning woman. They were in that space, as was I, and we knew that we were going to move out of that space. So this is a way of, of not reifying the subject that is the immigrant, right? So all these different, and the list, you know, could go on, but I won't now. Uh, ah, now the other thing, I should have a blank slide in here. Just an example of destabilizing, a stabilized meaning, I want to deal with remittances. Now remittances is one of those very powerful terms. It starts as a little word to remit, and now it's a category. We say remittances, we say a whole pile of things. We say poor immigrants in rich countries, they work in the rich countries, they send a lot of their money back home. If you take just a little lateral step, a little difference, and you ask, not where are the immigrants sending their remittances, their money, but you ask who are the main remittance receiving countries, you get a very different list because you get in the top 10, five rich countries. And the United States is in the top 20. Now, that's a different measure from what is the main country that is sending remittances. Now, here, I'm sorry that this is sort of marked up here. That's the source. And if you take India and China by model, you have seven rich countries. Now, I mention this partly because there is sort of a little emergent little thingy that is very nasty, which is so here they come. They take our jobs, and then they send the money back home. This is a figure from before 208 when the crisis comes. When 208 happens, some of these figures change, it should be said, you know, because right now we are, uh, there are very little remittances. It's rather, in some cases, reverse remittances, like poor families in Mexico or in Colombia are sending money to their uh, you know, family in the United States because they can't have jobs, they're being persecuted, etc. But the main point here, it's more to illustrate a tactical move. You switch the question just a bit and you produce another mapping of a reality. And it means, of course, the professionals. Each of these cases is different because clearly in the, in the case of the European Union, you have all kinds of things that have to do with, you know, neighboring countries, permissions to move. So it is sort of a a way of illustrating, if you want. Now, oopsie, this is, this is funny. Oh, you know what, this changed uh, <laughs> the resetting. Well, anyhow, so the making of today's phase, what I want to emphasize here is actually, this was in the form of a list. Now it's all a bit mixed up. But I'm arguing that what we have today was made. And so I have a list of items. Some may have disappeared. And the basic figures that you see, this belongs up on top, this title, is from 1986 to 208. Just looking. And from 208 on, it has increased further, actually. Just line watch hours went from 2.5 million to 200 million. This is this making, this very practical, pragmatic. Border control budget from 151,000, from uh, 151 million, I'm sorry, this is wrong, to 7.9 billion. Uh, INS budget from 4.7 billion to 35 billion. So all these increases, now behind each of those numbers lies actually a reality. Now, I don't know how this is broken up. But the other critical thing that I wanted to emphasize, and I would love to get, since you are mostly lawyers, I gather, uh, I think that a critical element is that the state has authorized itself to violate its own law. And so it's legal to do illegal things. And of course, Patriot Act. Now here are a few very, again, this was, this was a list and now it's all sort of a text. But um, so Patriot Act authorizes the immediate deportation, Patriot Act is our emergency law, as you probably know. The immediate deportation of any alien, both documented and not, 
without hearings or evidence, if the Attorney General considers him or her possibly dangerous. Now, backstory here is that immigration control has moved, you know this better than I do, has moved from many different, it used to be in the Labor Department a long time ago, then it moved to justice, now it is in Homeland Security. You probably know that. Now, Homeland Security is about Homeland Security. And so right now, of course, we all remember and we recognize the difference between immigrants in that agency versus the potential terrorists. But in 10 years, how fuzzy can it get? To what extent does the shift from one part of the state to another further authorize the state or enable the state to violate its own law? So now immigrants are suddenly in the same sort of structural situation, if you want, as ter potential terrorists. Now, after 201, this is also, to me, extremely significant. The making of immigration sort of little laws, bills, and there are more now. These are vast numbers. This is unconstitutional, strictly speaking. Immigration is a federal mandate in the United States. It is not the business of little little sheriffs like Sheriff Arpaio to have a little bill and said, what I'm doing is legal. Raids at night against the law, raids on the workplace against the law, detention, unlawful detention, it's against the law. But now it is enabled. It's enabled by these little bills, it's, which are themselves a violation of the, of the Constitution. This final point. <laughs> This is a very problematic authorization. You see, and it also, it sort of goes against <coughs> some very, very basic principles. So anyhow, and there is much more that one could add to this list. Now, actually when people say that the state cannot make a difference, the state can make a big difference. And so this is the result. And, and um, 320,000 immigrants incarcerated awaiting trial or deportation. We know that some of those, that's unlawful detention. You know, we have these three sort of uh, permissions that amount to an illegal act if it were not for the emergency state that we have. Now, we know that some of those are citizens. They just look like Latinos. Can you hear me or not? Because um, we know that some of them are legal immigrants. When the raids happened, when they were detained in their car, whatever, they did not have their documents. Some of these people have been in there for more than a year. They have not been granted a hearing with a judge to demonstrate their documents. So this is unlawful detention. This is not some sort of, you know. Um, now, this is another consequence, a minimal entry. We now sort of basically, I mean, these figures are always in fluctuation, but basically the notion is we have zero. Zero is never a zero. You know, where you're dealing with questions that mix state and people, zero is an approximation. It doesn't mean literally, but the phrase is we have zero undocumented immigration. Now, very interesting point here. Just delete this. Huh? In 1980, the likelihood of undocumented migrants to return to the United States within a year was 46%. In 2007, it stood at 7%. And now, it supposedly stands at zero. Whatever zero exactly means. Now, this is to me an illustration of this notion of making. And, you know, and, and in thereby making a kind of subject that we call the immigrant today which is not necessarily the same subject than 20 or 30 years ago. So for me, the immigrant is a subject that does not really exist. It's made through policy. It's an artificial, partial subject, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, so here is another sort of datum that I'm just beginning to do research on, and some very interesting data have come out, and which is this, this private the privatizing of prisons. Now there have, contracts have been signed between, again, at the state level, not the federal government, but the state level, in several states with, uh, with private prisons, guaranteeing 
occupancy. Now, mind you, this is a very ambiguous moment. One judge who has been doing this for years went to jail. This is a case that lasted for a year, and he now has been, for doing this, for guaranteeing private prisons occupancy. Now, little transversal elements. You, you're lawyers, you remember three strikes and you're out. Huh? All these little laws, you, you stole three pizzas, by God, you were going to jail. The, length, the unlawful detention feeds into this, fantastically, you understand, into this business. Um, um, I mean, the lengthening of, of, uh, of, uh, of sentences, the delays in, in uh, allowing for hearings, many, a multiplicity of things come together. Now, I know I sound a bit like I'm demonizing things, but I'm just, that is why I started out, you know, this is also an analytic tactic for me, to capture all the elements, the empirical elements that are constructing a possibility. I'm not talking about causation. I'm not talking about overdetermined. There are also overdetermined outcomes in many ways. I'm just talking about all kinds of elements that come together and produce a kind of a little vortex that moves in a given direction. Now here are some of these figures, <laughs> beds. I mean, that's literally the language. A big report just came out that, that, that captures a lot of these things, you know, because this, there's a lot of research on private prisons. I've long been working on this and very interested. But anyhow, the beds, huh? So the public beds are the red ones, and the, and the, the private beds are the, the blue ones. Now, you can see that the private beds have grown. So have, by the way, the, the public beds. But look what feeds the growth. You know, it's this. This is the business. Now, I have some other charts, which I eliminated because I have too many, which is the amount of money that has been spent. There are two enormous uh, lobbies for private prisons. The private prisons now, their stock is doing extremely well on Wall Street. I have those charts, too, if you want to see them. So you say, wow, they're doing well. So they are lobbying in Washington, and they are playing the stock market. This is a growth sector. I mean, they're also in there, in just a little background, fuzzy background. I don't want to make too much out of it. The state as policeman, you know? The, the, the flattening of the state into a simpler institution than it is meant to be and than it could be. Uh, let's see what I have next here. I can't remember now. Yeah. Oh, this is corporate lobbying, et cetera. There you see these, I mean, just extraordinary. Those are the two organizations. <laughs> they're like two super lobbies. Uh, and immigrant detention budgets up. We, the taxpayers, we, the citizens, are funding this. And so I want to get eventually at the structural approximation. You know, I never paid attention when I start. I always have a clock and I never forget to look at it. So, okay, fine. Now, here's another element. Now, here I want to begin to move into this notion that, um, maybe I should clarify, that these, these two, I'm, I'm really interested. I wrote a very long article on, on this notion of these uh, new trans emerging transversal spaces that are bordered spaces. They cut across with enormous ease. The, uh, they cut across the, the traditional borders of the interstate system, you know, like capital flows, information flows, etc. But also the WTO, you know, workers who are hired through the WTO regime, who are the moment a firm hires a worker through the WTO regime, that employer produces a subject with formal portable rights across all the member countries. And no coyote is going to take you into that space, no trafficker. So I'm very interested in these transversal spaces. I've long been working on them, looking, I, I do a lot of work on high finance. And so when people say finance can cross these traditional borders, ser specialized services can, yes, but they create their own borders, and those borders are much tighter than any wall that we are building on the traditional borders. So for me, you know, when people say globalization, fewer borders, yeah, a weakening of interstate borders for certain actors, we know that only for certain, but what is totally left out of the picture are these transversalities. Now, on, in that same mode, but moving into a far more uh, ambiguous terrain, because a lot of that other stuff is pretty hardcore, you know, you can actually, but this is more ambiguous. And here what I want to begin to argue is that 
you know, you're either in some sort of privileged zone. If you're super rich, you move around, it really doesn't matter your citizenship, <coughs> what I was saying at the beginning. And if you are not, uh, while you may hate the immigrant, you, the citizen, hates the immigrant, I don't mean you clearly, you know what I'm saying, right? Uh, you're actually, structurally speaking, beginning to approximate. So that both the, the formal subject that is the immigrant and the citizen, which are anyhow mutants, uh, 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 begin to actually approximate, no matter the ideological distancing, no matter the, the renationalizing of membership politics. Now, I should give you a little footnote. I, you know, I'm not uh, sort of a, a, the typical immigration scholar or the typical citizenship scholar. I'm not the ultimate. My, my concern is always the non ex whatever my subject. So for citizenship, I define citizenship not in all the, not in terms of the, own, the ex itself, in other words, if citizenship is the X, my definition of citizenship is not the features of citizenship. Because for me, then, I don't advance anything. That's my problem with powerful, uh, right, what I was saying. So I want to look in the shadow. So for me, citizenship is basically an incompletely theorized contract between the state and a subject. And that relationship can change. In that incompleteness lies the possibility of citizenship to keep reinventing itself, to outlive many, many different regimes, and right now also to actually become a bimodal kind of condition where if you're very rich, it doesn't matter very much. You are a citizen of all of a certain kind of global space. And if you are not so rich and not so powerful and poor, your citizenship doesn't get you very far. Or let's put it differently, you're getting less and less for whatever that contract. It's a devalued contract. So anyhow, so in that spirit then, what follows, which is the surveillance regime. Now we're not talking little cameras that measure the velocity of your car or that take in a static way whatever happens in the train station. I'm not, this is active surveillance, but it is also a passive condition. They're just surveying. So there was a whistleblower who just appeared about three weeks ago, exited the surveillance space. And he gave us some additional information. I'm now an activist, not so much on immigration, but on some of this unlawful detention, pretrial, solitary confinement, those kinds of issues. And so uh, just to give you an example, just a little example. And this concerns mostly citizens. Because I, you know, I really think that making too much of an invidious distinction doesn't help us understand the current moment, the current making of subjects, etc., rights-bearing subjects, supposedly. So, so there is a thing in the United States, I'm sure that some of you know this, so I apologize for repeating what you already know, but the National Security Letter. Anybody heard of that? Oh, okay. So very little is said about it. Nothing is written about it, really. So the National Security Letter is a letter that you get from the United States Department of Justice, basically. And, uh, and it says, you keep on living your life, but from now on, you're under continuous surveillance. You cannot tell anybody, not your partner, not your lawyer. Final item, if a judge calls you for a hearing concerning this national security letter, you cannot tell anybody either. You cannot come with a lawyer because you're not meant to tell a lawyer that you've gotten this letter. Now, that puts you in a place where we who are trying to get a handle on this, we know something. So we thought that there were thousands of these letters that had gone out. Because there are little clues, there are little, you know, I mean, we can talk, but you know, there are codes. And so. Well, the, the, the whistleblower gave us an hour. He lasted, by the way, half an hour in the media, and then nobody has heard of him again. But he gave us two interesting items. So one of them was there are hundreds of thousands of these letters that have gone out. To sit, they're mostly going to citizens. This is not immigrants, these are citizens. And, and the other item that he told us was, uh, all right, 30 trillion emails that, are, that belong to a whole large number of people that are sort of being actively you know, examined, et cetera. Now, these are mostly citizens. So the, the, the um, and you have read all of this, right? By the way, I should add before I move to the, I'm going to show you a visual here. Um, that there are a lot of private companies involved in the surveillance space. The surveillance space, you know, it, it's, uh, it's not clandestine, 
we know it exists, we just don't have full information about it. And, uh, and there's huge buildings. Um, but there are these interesting things that, that are not so easy to get a handle on. For instance, we have at least these 265 private companies. Now, these private companies hire, as it is usually said, I hate this, they hire talent. You know, great mathematicians, great software engineers, you mean talent. I hate that term, talent, yeah. So, so, um, so the talent, hey, if the best mathematician is a Russian, you bring in the Russian. You don't have to be a citizenship. It's talent. This is one of these transversal spaces. By the way, I'm looking at the, at the US, at the UK, and at Germany. These three are critical. You know, it's a, truly a transnational space. That also explains the sort of the denationalized uh, nationality issue here of the expert. Now, here is what we know. This is an amazing effort by all kinds of people that came out, part of it came out in the Washington Post. Uh, and it really, it, it was accessed you know, through freedom of information, et cetera. So this has about uh, 10,000 buildings that do surveillance. And you know this, this famous little book, The Back Room, The Back Room, where everything becomes a technical issue, like the case of napalm, napalm, used to, to not resist water. So, you know, we have the Pentagon transcripts now that say, um, uh, God, there's so much water there, those Vyats can just run into the water. And, and so it became a backroom, prob backroom problem. How do we make a napalm that can withstand water? And they did. The atomic bomb is another example, right? So, so this has a bit of that effect. You have these brilliant mathematicians doing, you know, physicists really doing the mathematical issues. You have the software engineers. And a lot of this is a technical problem. It is not, ah, we're going to get, you know, they're not, it's not a political project. It's like a technical project, which I don't know if that is good or bad. I just mentioned that. Now, we know this. What we don't know is what we don't know. Huh? You know, uh, Rumsfeld might have put it. Um, so this is in the last one that was finished building. These are all big physical structures in Washington. It's huge. It like occupies a whole part of the city. Um, it, was, it was in Utah, one of the biggest, a huge building with enormous, you know, embedded capacities. Now, so, so my question vis-a-vis -vis this, kind of, um, this kind of a thing is, who are we? We who are out here. So why does all of this exist? This exists for our security, right? All of the surveillance is, not because they're curious about our market choices, it's there supposedly, it's a state project, uh, it's there for our security. For our security, we need to be surveyed full time. That means that for our security, we all have to first be suspect. Whoever is on that territory, could be immigrants, could be citizens, etc. Now I'm using this little item, I'm running out of time, I know, to signal these stru the structural approximations. So you have unlawful detention, <coughs> national security letters, and this is just one vector. Huh? Uh, Pre-trial solitary confinement, I don't know if I just mentioned that, talked about that, it's, you know, these kinds of issues. And they, they represent abuses on both immigrants and citizens. I want to pull out, again, analytic tactic. Huh? I'm not denying all the, the, if you want, the conventional or established notions here. Uh, what, who are we? Who are we for whose security? Are we the new colonials? No matter, you know, you're either in or you're out. If you're all suspect, I mean, who are we? So I'm trying to bring down this invidious notion, which is very strong in the United States and I know in some European countries. I will not say anything about the Netherlands. Uh, which was until, recent, until recently, it is a rather reasonable <laughs> country, but it seems to be a bit less reasonable now. So, um, but compared to the United States, it's reasonable. So, you know, those are the kinds of issues. Now, I had, I had a couple of other things. I wanted to, to talk about inequality and how it hits. I just want to get, these are some beautiful graphs, but I can't. So, this is an example. This hits both immigrants and, uh, and citizens. Now, this is part of a little project that I'm doing that I call expulsions, and this is a clearly a very dramatic one. So foreclosure. So what we have had is between 2006 and 2010, we basically are, well, what we have 
in fact, we have 14 million foreclosures on homes, on households. A household can be one person, three people, etc. And w between 12 seconds to attend, what you know is at 9.2 million. The Federal Reserve just announced three weeks ago another six million people are going to be out. I mean households. Now, I try to make these figures Pythagorean. So it's the equivalent of evicting the whole of the Dutch population, because we're talking 35 million people. Do you understand? The whole population of the Netherlands, and then again. That is what has happened. And if we are going to go, there's other six million, now finally the government is trying to, then it will be yet again. I mean, this is mostly citizens. So we have to, now I'm not trying to say that citizens are as badly off as immigrants, because what we're seeing with immigrants is terrible. But what I'm trying to argue is that I, at least as a researcher and a theorist, I can't just take these categories. I need to understand what is it. When I say these two terms, the immigrant and the citizen, what am I not seeing? And hence, if you want, looking at this larger space around it. OK, he just told me that I have to shut up. So thank all oh, dead cities. This image from a Chinese who got sick of all the high-rise buildings in Shanghai. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. <laughs>
when we look back in history um, and uh, look then back to the, to the present, I think you can see a lot of uh, uh, continuities. Um, one of the things that she says is that um, in order to establish uh, membership, racial membership, uh, uh, the state manages the intimate domain more than the public domain. And um, one day, way to do this is through surveillance of these uh, family relationships. So in order to uh, guard economic privileges, which are, were considered wild, white male privileges, and I would argue still are, um, it mean, meant that family relationships had to be uh, um, guarded. And uh, the, I think the most important way to do that was, and still is, uh, to see them as fraudulent. And so to see family relationships as fraudulent. Mm -hmm. uh, this was central uh, in colonial times, Dutch colonial times, as Stoller uh, explained. Um, for instance, the uh, legal acknowledgement of children of Dutch fathers and native women um, they were often seen as fraudulent uh, legal acknowledgments. Uh, it was uh, thought that this father had no real ties to this child, was not a real father often, uh, and that it was only a means to get the status connected to that and then the economic privileges connected to, to this status. Um, And also, I think, central here is that the father was absent, or was thought of as absent. It was not that he was always absent. He was thought of as absent because the woman could not establish a relationship through the colonial, uh, with colonial state on her own. She needed a husband because a woman on her own yeah, cannot consent to a relationship to, uh, with the state. Um, so this was also central, I think, in this way of thinking. Um, in the mother country, so to speak, in the Netherlands, but also in many other countries, um, a similar line of thinking can be and could be for, uh, found. Um, yesterday, um, uh, Sarah explained how, until 1985, Dutch women who married a foreigner uh, had not the same citizenship rights as uh, Dutch men who married a foreign until woman. When was that? 19 85. Wow, so quite recent, yes, a bit more recent than the United States. Uh, um, and then equality, gender equality was introduced in citizenship law. But was it? I would question uh, that it, this was really the case. Uh, because what changed uh, in the law was not that women were granted the same citizenship rights as men, but the rights of men were taken from them because they wanted to, didn't want to give it to, the women, to women. Uh, and this was because women were not seen as the free, uh, liberal, autonomous individual that could freely choose a foreign partner because they could not be trusted to make the right choice. <laughs> so what happened that was... That just happen in the, in the Netherlands. No, no, that <laughs> happened all around. Never yes, yes, that. yes. <laughs> it's always what happens, I think, well, maybe not always, but... <laughs> Uh, uh, almost uh, always, I think, uh, you can see it in several countries, at the moment that gender equality was introduced, it was a negative equality. So women did not get the same rights as men, but men, men lost some of their rights and uh, it was uh, uh, gender equality at a lower level. I think that that is very disturbing. And I think that is central mm -hmm. for um, and very determined for the restrictive immigration policies that we have now. Uh, because until then, men had, well, they had a right to choose home and family. Uh, since then, this right to choose home and family has been come under pressure more and more because of these changes, I think, and maybe not all, only, but I think it is central in, in what uh, we can see now. Um, uh, another example that I want to name is, of course, the, what is called in the United States the anchor babies. Uh, so a baby that you throw out like an anchor. Um, and who does the throwing then? Of course, the migrant woman. Again, here the father is absent, and this is part of the problem. These um, women are seen as unbed mothers, although often they are not. But uh, 
Um, and because the father is absent, because the male is absent, they can't really consent. So this is a problem um, of, of uh, having a baby on US territory in order to obtain citizen status and status and the economic privileges connected to that. Um, then I want to go to the European Union. Um, union citizenship is better than national citizenship now, nowadays, because at, as a union citizen, you have more rights in immigration law than as a national citizen. Um, and so it's no surprise that here, fraudulent, the idea of fraudulent marriages pops up in recent years, um, where it concerns union citizens with a third country national spouse. Um, and you can see that in several, several countries and in European law, um, the European Commission and uh, the European Court have said that member states can uh, deny family reunification in case there's a fraudulent marriage. Um, so the union citizen with the third country national, they are the new suspects. And um, it is no concern, uh, no coincidence, that often these union citizens are females and the third country nationals are males. Um, so just to name some examples uh, of the Dutch case, um, um, when there was a lot of talk of the Belgian, so-called Belgian roots, uh, that is going to Belgium as, yes, uh, as a Dutch national uh, with your third country national spouse in order to acquire union, the status of a union citizen, which means more relaxed immigration rules. It was connected with fraudulent marriages and forced marriages. It was said that Turks and Moroccans, meaning Dutch nationals of Moroccan of Turkish or Turkish descent, uh, did this, although it turned out that was not the case. Uh, in order to acquire union citizenship status. Uh, special projects were, were set up to check especially these marriages of union citizens with third country nationals, uh, with the INS, the Dutch INS, and uh, with uh, Dutch embassies. Uh, they were looking for what they were called conspicuous strangeness of partners for each other. Uh, and unlikely combinations, <laughs> unlikely combinations of partners such as Poles and Egyptians, very unlikely, <laughs> or Bulgarian, uh, Bulgarians and Turks. This is incredible. Um, they were mentioned as is examples. This is EU level or Dutch? This is Dutch level, yes. But I think it's not typical for Dutch uh, because you can see it also, especially in the UK. I think you see the same line of thinking very uh, uh, clearly. Uh, although they might mention some other unlikely combinations. Um, recently, I had some contact with a an, um, an, uh, trainee from the Dutch embassy at Cyprus. And at Cyprus, all, Dutch, uh, all embassies, not only the Dutch, all European embassies are very concerned because two municipalities on Cyprus, they don't check uh, marriage certificates too well. So this is a road into the EU for, uh, again, uh, fraudulent marriages. Uh, so I asked this trainee, so how much does this happen? And how often? And who are those people? Uh, a lot. It happens a lot. And uh, most of them are Nigerians. When I read her thesis, it turned out the Dutch embassy had two cases of Nigerian men marrying Dutch women. Uh, that was thought as a fraudulent marriage, so that was not too much. But um, what I want to point out is um, how the management of the intimate is very important in surveillance uh, and migration control. Um, how also the notion of the liberal individual, the consenting free inf individual, is very important here uh, because women are often thought of as not being, being as Pateman also said, eh? uh, uh, not being able to consent or always to consent. Uh, how consent <laughs> is, is viewed is very uh, ambiguous. Uh, and how it is a racial and gendered project uh, um, 
in order to, to guard these economic privileges. And that uh, the restrictive immigration laws that we have nowadays is uh, to, uh, to a large part, I think, the, con the result of these developments that, uh, that I described. That was it. Very, very Thank you. Much. Thank you very much. Mm. Again, Zeske, would you like to respond for, say, two minutes? Actually, I am very interested in two of the points um, that you brought up. And so in my reading of history, I'm talking really European history and internal migration in Europe, not, not, in, not transcontinental. And so my reading is partly because the city plays such an important role historically in the whole notion of incorporating the outsider, that when the outsiders succeed in their claims for rights or for accommodations or for whatever recognition, when they succeed, that the effect is to expand the rights of the, those who are already included as well. And I thought, and, and so for instance, when you look at historical demography, the fact that so many of the European, I always like to say we Europeans are a Creole people, you know, it's a bit of a provocation as an image, clearly, but um, we are mixed. And so I want to, so, so and, and sort of, I, the, the example that I, that I used to make clearer what I'm trying to say is a public transport system or a public health system. If you're going to have a working public health system, a working public transport system is maybe a better example. You need very, a very thin criterion for, uh, for membership, for access. You can't just check, okay, did you just murder somebody? Are you, you know, what is your religion? No, everybody has to be included. And to see a working public transport system as an achievement whereby, you know, the more people you include, the thinner the condition for membership. And so I don't know if I'm, am I communicating at all here or not? Because I see some faces at least I say, what are we talking about now? Public transport. So, you know, so then when you were saying right now that, um, that EU membership is more generous, that, that national membership is losing ground, the citizen, the national citizen is losing ground, whereas EU, though it is a very thin membership, right? It's a much thinner citizenship, EU citizenship, but that it is a more generous one. I heard you say that. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that is immediately a very interesting point because it's this notion that the working civic condition cannot have a very thick criterion for membership. It's got to be indifferent in a way. And I mean that in a positive sense, uh, to all kinds of attributes. And so I'm just very curious about a possible trajectory. Now, I'm just throwing out thoughts. You said, you know, I'm just thinking aloud here. You know, I'm not saying that I have any ground. And here is a possibility that there, are, there is a, a possibly, and we might be at the beginning of such a trajectory, a kind of a divergence where this very thin kind of citizenship that is the EU citizenship uh, actually gains, succeeds in including more people, and who knows where that goes, because those material conditions of inclusion have their own consequences, if you want. Whereas national citizenship, you know, you lose rights, inequality, fewer health rights, fewer this, you know, the, the whole notion of the neoliberal project, to put it in short. I mean, do we have any indications, or do we know anybody who's doing research about this possibility, because I think that that could be a very interesting. I think that we need to move to a space where thick criteria for membership need to be diluted. I think that thickness, you know, of the ethnic, of religion, of like the racial thing, the strange, the, the conspicuous strangeness, you know, these are all thick criteria that guide that. And the notion that the European, I happen, you know, I don't live in the EU, so I, of course, admire the EU. I think it's a format for the future, though uh, it's not going to be able to be replicated anywhere else in the world, but that doesn't mean that it cannot be a format for the future. So I'm very curious about that. Do you have any thoughts or anybody else? Um, or did I take a ball and ran with it in a direction that... Uh, well, I think there's <laughs> a lot of, of research on these uh, 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 notions of EU membership and what it means. And 
how it is the same or not the same uh, as national citizenship. I know, but I mean the but divergence, I, you know, the weakening yeah. of the national and then the expanding of the EU, possibly. I, yeah. I'm not sure that uh, that um, EU membership is based on uh, thinner characteristics, uh -huh. as you said. Really? Uh, um, and I think this fraudulent marriage uh, idea of, uh, yeah. especially EU citizens with a third country national, is, a, is an example of that. Right, right. Now, I'm um, not saying that it's perfect, but it has to be thinner than national citizenship. Mm -hmm. Because national citizenship is very charged, and, it, it, and they are thickening it more. I find that very, mm -hmm. even as we lose rights, they're, they're, you know, this, like in the United States, our constitution speaks of the person. And the way it gets, the person gets interpreted in different epochs is quite interesting. I'm sure you, you, some of you are aware of this. And so right now, the person is just the citizen, whereas in the 1960s, a time of embedded liberalism, the person included, and you have like very distinguished legal scholars like Karst, who argue that actually the immigrant is also that person of the constitution, and, and that the immigrant has far more rights then the immigrant is claiming or is getting recognized, you know? So, well, anyhow, I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry. I, I just, I, I find this extremely interesting. So. I see several people who want to respond. Yes. Um, I, will, I, will, I, will, I, I want to share two observations. One is that, that we have seen two different analytical -litical tactics of destabilizing the citizen immigrant uh, uh, distinction. Uh, Saskia has uh, sh has argued that there is a structural way in which, at least on the top and bottom level, they become to look very much or to be experienced as quite similar. Um, and Betty has used another tactic, saying, "Well, maybe these people are not only structurally approx approximated, but also physically and sexually approximated." Yes. So that's another. It, it's, it's fascinating to see that there's one analytical, uh, two, two different strategies of, of breaking down this, this or, or, or doing something with the distinction. One is Betty's is more empirical, and your is more analytical. I, I find it a fascinating combination. Uh, the second is that th I, I would like to, to, to throw in on the, the discussion you were having that a thin um, uh, uh, thinness is not necessarily more inclusive. You see in several European countries now that the, the welfare state is being, uh, the, uh, the, the idea is circulated. The welfare state is like an insurance company, which is willing to take on everyone. More business is better. Uh, but then, if you haven't been insured for five or ten years, you're not in. So you, yeah. you can be an immigrant, yeah. you can yeah. come here, but only after ten years of legal residence and tax paying, you're part of the welfare state. So I don't think it, the, the combination it between... doesn't necessarily have to be. There's no necessary yes, combination. Absolutely. Good point. I'm going to... There were two people who... who, who, who three people. I'm going to give the, the, the microphone to the person who hasn't spoken yet. Wonderful. Uh, my name is Bahija Aras, I'm from the FU, FU University, a PhD candidate, and I uh, had a question for uh, Professor Sasson, um, but I think it's already mentioned in the discussion afterwards. Um, about your last slide, I was wondering whether you... The guest slide? The last slide? Oh, the last slide. About exclusion and, and in what terms oh, you expulsions. use that. Expulsion, uh, expulsion sorry. One? Yeah. Um, um, and I think that draws back to the, the discussion you had afterwards about the citizenship concept. Um, and I was fascinated by the, the tactic that you have um, uh, in mind um, of looking at what's not there. And um, you mentioned that you have uh, to, 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 um, to explain the moment and what's happening, you need to look at the, at the general picture. And that is citizenship probably... Um, has an impact on how we uh, co concept the immigrant. And that's why I wondered what you mean with uh, ex expulsions. expulsions. Um, but I read it as exclusion, so my question no, is probably no. not... Um, yeah. But I had the, 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 the example in uh, Holland of uh, the exclusion in legal terms, as in um, everyone who has the nationality is uh, a citizen, and exclusion in, of course, in in other terms, as in, sure. Um, sure. Uh, you have, uh, yeah. even if you have the nationality, but you can be, um, in ethnic terms, not Absolutely. a citizen. So yes, 
I, I think I, I, let me just say that I use the term expulsion purposefully to capture something that is not social exclusion. Social exclusion is a well-established category, and I think a lot of that is happening. I am, when this little project on expulsions, I'm looking at a variety of instances uh, in the global south and in the global north, very different, like <coughs> displaced peoples in the global south, uh, uh, what mining is doing and land, you know, 220 million hectares of land have been bought in South America and in uh, Africa and in certain parts of Asia. And that means all kinds of people are literally expelled. Faunas, floras, villages, smallholder agriculture, small rural mine, expelled. You know, talking about expulsions that happen in a way, in, sure, in the interiority of the system, but not like social exclusion. It's, it's like social exclusion is, is part of the system. This is something else. I'm, and again, I'm sort of in the middle of this. Some of the stuff that I presented here has to do with that. Now, um, I think that, that uh, I think that what is happening in just coming back to the citizen and the and the and the immigrant. Huh? I just want to say something that I didn't. I've written about this for years now, but I just want to emphasize. I think that in in a way we're dealing with a range of subjects, right? So you have the fully. You know, the, the typical well-off middle-class person is the one who probably benefits the most from what we call the liberal state, right? Now, you can have undocumented immigrants who are long-term residents, who live especially in big cities like New York, who engage in the practices, the daily practices of the citizens, whose children have gone to college. Now that the law is coming down, they suddenly discover, oh my God, I'm undocumented. And they have lived the lives of middle class people. And, 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 and one um, uh, legal scholar has argued this is a kind of informal social contract that happens, you see. And so again, I'm, I'm very interested in finding conditions that destabilize the invidious distinction. And then you have full-fledged citizens, women, uh, minoritized people of all sorts. Could also, we could add gays. It's not just a question of race, etc. There are many, many different things. Uh, who are I call them authorized, but not fully recognized. Whereas that informal middle class family uh, is unauthorized, but actually recognized, fully re recognized, as in recognized as a as a you know as a peer of sorts. So the map that I see again, I didn't talk about this because. But the MAPC is rather complex. When you throw in the super rich who are now moving around, like we just did a research project, if you just look something like the super housing market, in a city like London, 80% foreign owned. In a city like Frankfurt, 70% foreign owned. In Zurich, 90% foreign. I mean, we have a whole, they don't pay taxes, they don't constitute community, the civic, etc. You know, who are these people? But by God, they are, they are actually illegal in many ways. You know, they're unauthorized, but they're fully recognized. You know, they, hey, they can do what they want. So I'm really interested in unsettling some of these statuses. Now, I know that, and that is why I don't reject the foundational definitions, that there is a difference. When the chips are down, there is a difference between being a citizen and being an undocumented immigrant, especially if you're poor. But anyhow, the expulsions project, I think I better not talk about it because it would take me just a bit. But the, the, the core idea is if you, this is an analytic tactic. Huh? If I position myself at the systemic edge, the systemic edge is not the geographic border. Huh? If I, do I see that this system takes in people, let's say as a Keynesian, if I positioned myself during the Keynesian years at the edge of the system, I could say the system is taking in people, not because it's nice, there were all kinds of racisms, but because it was centered on mass consumption and mass production. So there was a systemic logic that says, come in, come in, consume, etc., and and good wages so that they could. I say today, it's expelling people. So the foreclosures are one instance. But so are the fact that we have more and more displaced people in the Global South who are never going to go back home. They've been expelled. You see, so it is a totally different uh, terrain that I'm looking through that. And, and um, anyhow, I would love to talk about it, but this is not the time. But thank you for your question. I hope that, that I clarified some of the issues that were hanging in there uh, that you connected to exclusion.